Hi class, in this presentation I would like to explain the concept of receptive fields. In particular, let's look at how an on-center receptive field works. Neurons that have associated receptive fields exist in a wide variety of sensory systems, so it is an essential feature of sensory processing. So as I mentioned before in previous videos, the brain has evolved in a way that allows it to achieve the ultimate goal of survival of the organism. And it has evolved to do so in a pretty efficient way. Here is one of the examples of how the brain solves a sensory processing challenge, univariance. Please make sure you are really familiar with this concept as it is discussed in the text, by the way. What univariance means is that neurons can only transmit a one-dimensional signal. When a neuron is excited or activated, it sends an electrical signal toward the other neurons connected to it and uses neurotransmitters via chemical reactions to either excite another neuron or inhibit another neuron. So there is only one type of signal to communicate. However, sensory stimulation doesn't just consist of one aspect of stimulation. Instead, it is multidimensional information. For example, in the somatosensory system, a touch of the arm conveys the exact lo location of the touch, the magnitude of the pressure, the temperature of the object touching your arm, and so on. So, how does a neuron encode and transmit so many aspects of the stimulus all at the same time? The brain's solution is to have a large group of neurons, a population of neurons, to work together in transmitting the multidimensional sensory input all at once. Depending on all these various qualities of the stimulus, a particular activation pattern of neurons occurs, which can be composed of excited neurons inhibited neurons, and even idle neurons. And these different combinations all correspond to a unique stimulation. At first glance, this might seem like this would take a lot of energy in the brain to process all this sensory information simultaneously, but the trick is that the same population of neurons can be employed to process a huge range of stimuli. So it's actually energy efficient. It's sort of like having one appliance that can sort your clothes, wash your clothes, dry your clothes, and fold and press them all in one try. So in the, sensor, in the somatosensory system, some design features include that each neuron is responsive to only one type of receptor, each neuron has a sophisticated receptive field, and the size of receptive field is variable depending on the location of the stimulus and the need to process information. So to use the same analogy, we could take apart this fictional laundry machine and see that there are specific components inside that each have their own sometimes singular responsibility and can be activated or not, depending on what we need it to do for any one job. Let's look at an example of sensory processing involving receptive fields. How do we know which part of the arm is being touched? Each neuron in the somatosensory area of the brain receives stimulation from a specific area of the skin. This particular area is called the receptive field right here. Uh, zoomed in, you can see it a little bit bigger right there in the kind of larger circle with a smaller circle in the middle. The neuron receives information only from receptors located within the boundaries of this whole location right here. In the thalamus, each somatosensory neuron has a receptive field that has a center area and a surrounding area outside the center. All the receptors from this whole receptive field have a connection to a target neuron. But some of them send excitatory signals along a centralized pathway, which is the blue connection here, while others send inhibitory signals, which are the red connections here. 
It's this combination of inhibitory and excitatory signals that our brain interprets to try and process all the, all the kinds of stimulus information we're experiencing at once. If something touches the center of the receptive field, like this imaginary pen, the blue connection is activated and the target neuron is activated. This is an on state. So this type of receptive field is called an on-center receptive field. In the timeline to the right right here, each tick mark represents an excitation of the neuron. In a normal or idle state, a neuron might fire occasionally, like in these little spots right here. But when the center of its receptive field is directly stimulated, the neuron is excited repeatedly in a quick succession for the duration of the stimulation. Once the stimulation is gone, the neurons return to a random firing idle state. So one way that you could imagine this would be to touch your arm with the tip of a pen lightly and hold that tip of the pen on your skin for a few moments. And as the pen tip is held, you continue to feel that on center receptive field. And then once you remove it, the sensation is now gone. In contrast, when something touches the outside area of the uh, receptive field here, called the surround, the red connection is activated and the target neuron is inhibited. You can see the inhibitory pathway there. That's why in the literature, this neuron is said to have an on-center but off-surround receptive field. Perhaps the purpose for this is so that the skin can detect very small changes in the relative size or position of a stimulus, and it would be harder for the sensory pathways to do that if the entire area of the stimulation was being activated at the same time. Something else that is sort of weird and interesting here, if we, took, if we, if we look at the timeline of neuron activity here, we see a silence period for the duration of the stimulation in the surround area. This is a decrease of firing rate in the neurons lower than the typical idle state before, but note that there is usually a rebound of high level activity afterwards in the inhibition period, after the inhibition period, but it is somewhat unclear what the purpose is for that or how it happens. So what happens when both the center and the surround are stimulated at the same time? Well, since we have both excitatory and inhibitory signals, they cancel each other out and the neuron ends up not receiving any signal. Uh, so it remains idle with random occasional activities as can be seen in the timeline of activities here. In this situation, there is stimulation, but this neuron is not doing anything to localize the stimulus. If we just look at this one neuron, we would not know what is happening. This is why we need a population of neurons, even though neuron X is not saying anything, the idle state becomes meaningful when considered with what its collaborators are doing at the same time. So this is where it gets really interesting in my opinion. The brain area responsible for the somatosensory information from the arm, for example, have millions of neurons who are or which are associated with partially overlapping receptive fields on the skin of the arm. Neuron one might have uh, an on center in the off surround of neuron two and vice versa. If you look at this area carefully, it's like a Venn diagram. You can see sort of where the overlap is and isn't. So I'm showing four different locations, A, B, C, and D in the stimulation graph. Stimulus A is in the off surround for both neuron one and neuron two. So I denoted them both with a negative sign uh, in the right here. Uh, Stimulus B in comparison is the on center of neuron two, but happens to be in the off surround of neuron one. So we have a plus sign for neuron two and a negative sign for neuron one. In this fashion, we can use the activation pattern of these two neurons to decode four different locations. Of course, there are many other receptive fields overlapping with these receptive fields, 
to provide even more fine-grained discrimination of stimulus locations. So the basic idea here is population coding, but on a rather small scale, of course. So as you can see uh, on this very strange looking hand here, there is a relationship between the size of a receptive field and the sensitivity of that area of skin. For the arm, for example, the neurons in the arm uh, region of the somatosensory area have relatively large receptive fields. This means that two different stimulus locations may end up feeling like the same location because the neural activation pattern will be the same. In the graph, we see both stimuli hitting the center of the same receptive field. In other words, sensitivity with stimulus location on the arm is not very high. We don't have a very precise sense of where on the arm is the stimulus. For contrast though, for a body area where we need more precise localization, such as the hand, for example, uh, the hand region of somatosensory area has much smaller receptive fields. So in the, in the drawing here, you can see that these uh, same two stimuli would fall on different receptive fields uh, than they would as if they were on the arm up here, even though they're the same distance apart. So they would likely feel uh, like they were in different locations of the hand whereas they would feel relatively the same on the arm. So there is a relationship between the size of the receptive field and the sensitivity of the area of the body. Uh, one way to think of it is that smaller receptive fields are associated with the higher level of sensitivity. So here is a, another really cool and weird diagram that shows that there is a relationship regarding the size of receptive fields which is consistent with the relationship of the size of the brain area for any given body region and the sensitivity of that body region. In the somatosensory area of the cortex, we see that all the body parts are re represented in this map. Uh, we can see that the hand region, which is where the blue line is right here, is larger than the line for the wrist, which means that there are more neurons devoted to the sensory information coming from the hand than there are from the wrist. This in turn means that each neuron may be associated with a smaller receptive field since we have a lot, have a lot of neurons to cover the whole hand uh, in, in terms of surface area. Having smaller receptive fields as we just discussed means that we can have a higher level of sensitivity in that part of the body. So in general, the larger that cortical area in the somatosensory map, the more sensitive is the corresponding body region. So just to kind of take this uh, another level, look at how sensitive it is between the upper lip and the lower lip. Now this would be an area that would be extremely sensitive and there's a lot of neurological uh, information being processed in very, very small receptive fields uh, because it takes a lot of brain energy to be able to uh, process that information on such a um, small scale